is class five of the six, and I can't believe how fast it's going. So um, last week I uh, let everyone know that I would finish my painting up and put that on the video, and then um, I wanted to just talk about it for just a few minutes. I don't know if you can see that over there. Okay, I probably still can't. Um, so the thing that I showed in the video was I had done some of the snow in class, and then I went back and I did this side, and then later on I decided it's not quite dark enough. And so I went and put another layer in here. And I wanted to talk a few minutes about snow and how you depict snow, um, because doing the little droplets of masking fluid to make it look like it's snowing, that's easy. And then when you actually come down to creating the snow itself, some of that can get a little like, I'm not sure what I need to do. The biggest thing to remember for snow is that it's a values game. If your snow goes darker because of shadows, you have to make sure that the values around it are darker so that they make that um, snow feel like it's still snow. It can have lots of color on it, just like anything that's white can have lots of color on it. But um, if, you know, if, you're, if your values around that area are not, dark, are not dark enough, so if I did not have enough value in the water or some of the trees and things around it, then it's not going to still appear as white, even though I've got lots of color on there. So um, I'm going to move these guys. And generally when I'm working with snow, I would prefer to put the color on a little light and then have to come back and glaze a thin layer over that and just build it if I want to. Um, actually, I'll show you right here. Um, so in the video, if you go back and watch, uh, in here I decided this was too pale because this is a um, sunset scene. It's toward evening. The snow should not appear too white. And uh, it was just not quite dark enough and so I went back and I can't remember in the video if I, I think I put some water up in here and then used a thin glaze of I believe it was manganese or not manganese sorry cerulean and I may even have grabbed a little bit of the purple mix which was my uh, pearl scarlet with a, a cobalt for this area and pushing this area a little darker will make this part of the oh, snow yeah, appear really lighter. Uh -huh. Yes. And I also put a little bit of shadow in here, and then I put a touch more in through here so that some of those areas get pushed back, and the lighter areas will appear lighter. So it's always kind of that push and pull when you're doing watercolor of how much um, value do I need to add. And it can just be a layer, and then come back and put another layer, and so you can slowly build it and decide. Um, and this snow was a little bit different than some snow that I do because of all the texture that's actually in the snow. Mm -hmm. And I didn't put all of the little marks that are on there. I put some of them. And that is the case with landscape in general. Don't feel like you have to put every branch, every um, bush, every tree. Some things can be grouped together. Some things, just a few marks here and there will give you the idea of, okay, that's a tree or that, those are leaves or a bush or marks in the snow. So um, it, it's sometimes that, that, especially in the background, that you just give a hint and people will know what it is and they'll finish it. And that's actually more exciting for the viewer to finish it themselves because then they're putting their imagination into it. Okay, so snow-wise, um, think about when you're looking at snow, actually, let me just cover that. Um, when you're looking at snow, think about the fact that the reason we know that it's snow is because there are shadows. And it then appears white because we see the shadows on top of it. If it's just white, we don't know what it is. So if I have, um, and I'm going to draw extra dark. Put that and maybe a trail. And if I use very fast here, and I just put in okay. If I just put in, geez, should have had the paint ready. <laughs> Okay, so if I just put in a, a quick sky, 
you can get the idea that it's a sky, partly because there's clouds and um, the color will tell you it's a sky. And then maybe this is a road. So I'll use a little bit of some brown. Maybe I'll tone it just a touch with the cerulean at the back. And then as it comes forward, I'll just go more into the burnt sienna. Okay. So there's the road. So at this point, we don't know what that is because there's no information. It's flat looking, it's white. It could be snow, but it could also be an area that the artist forgot to paint. So when you start giving um, some shadowing to it, maybe I've got some trees off to the side over there, or it could just be that the snow has some undulations to it. So if I take a little bit of water and I'm just going to kind of brush it around in there, and then I'll use a little bit of my Quinn Lilac with my Cerulean, since I've got the Cerulean out, um, and just add, oops, it's already dry. <laughs> Seriously, Colorado. Okay, so if I just add a little bit of some marks here and there, all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's snow, there's some shadows on it, and um, that just that movement of the, the line in here will make you go, okay, that's snow and it's in a landscape and I know what that is. Um, there are other ways to do snow that we'll talk about, but I wanted to also point out that your photograph can make the shadows look very different. It can depend on your printer, it can depend on um, <coughs> the light during that day. So the, this is a deep shadow yeah. and it's very blue. And there's nothing wrong with putting that in um, a scene and making it very blue. Um, my only issue with this one would be that all the blue is basically right here that's very intense. I might put just a touch of that blue up in here or up in the sky or something just to move that blue around. Um, and I may not push it as far as that, but you can have a lot of um, blues and kind of purpley. This one's a little more muted back here. Um, this, these two are a little lighter, a little less intense. This one has a little bit of some cerulean in it, but there's a lot of um, purples and blues in the shadows on here that gives it interest. And uh, then, let's see. This scene will show you how the printer can change what you're seeing. Or not the printer, the paper. So this is a HP glossy paper. And look how like turquoisey blue that looks. And then this was on uh, a separate piece of paper that is, I think this is um, Epson printer matte paper. And that color change can shift what you're seeing. This may also, um, I don't remember if I brought it into my photo software and played with the color too, because that is also something you could do. You could, you know, really play with it or you could push it because maybe you want your snow scene to look really intense. I would not paint it this intense, but um, yeah, so just, just be aware that your colors um, can be affected by the paper you printed on by the phone you're looking or the tablet you're looking at um, or how your camera takes it. So, but in general for snow, generally purples to blues, sometimes there's some warm tones in the snow. Um, this is one that I did a while back just as a quick demo and never finished it. And I have a little bit of some um, yellow in there because it was a sunny day and I wanted the snow to look like it was really warm. So, yeah, so then I'll use this one sort of as my example to do just a little bit on uh, for different effects for snow. And this painting already has a shadow in it that has both hard and soft edges. And the way to do that is, um, so I'm, I'm going to mess with it. There may be some that are going, no, don't do it, but um, I figure, all right, might as well. I'm probably never going to finish it, so... All right, so I have cobalt out. Um, I have my Quinn lilac out. You could use Quinn rose. Um, I tend to, if I want more of a purpley look, use that um, 
cooler red. And then if I want a warmer, I mean uh, more neutral purple, I will use um, my pearl scarlet. And the, the warmer red will always give you with blues a more muted um, purple mix or brownish mix, depending on what you mix. Okay. And uh, so if this were my tree and I wanted to add, maybe I wanted to add some branches to uh, this side over here, I can come in on dry paper and I can add some branches in there to make it feel like there's um, some shadow in on that area. Um, I could also, if I decided, hmm, I don't want all of those to be in focus, I want some of it to be sort of blurry feeling, I can wait for this to start to dry a little bit because right now it's actually a little too wet to do it. Uh, I could also use some clear water, just paint it on the paper and then come over and just by painting next to or on the clear water, you're going to get a blurry edge. Now, this has started to dry a little bit, so I can sort of soften that, and then I might come over and decide, yeah, I don't want this branch in focus. So just by taking a little bit of water next to it or around it, and your brush should be just slightly damp, you can fade or adjust or soften that edge. All right, and then, if, say, there's a, a hill right here, which um, I already sort of intimated, but if I want to um, make it stand out even a little more, I can use clear water, and I'll use some cerulean this time, and just a thin wash of cerulean in there can make that feel like this is kind of in shadow and that there's some highlighted areas and some other areas that are around it and that shadow could be a tree or it could be a hill, like I said. For the tree itself, I might, um, because I've already got some shadows going here, want to shadow um, all of these actually, because if you leave them flat like that, they're going to appear flat. So they need some kind of color. And because these are big bunches, um, I could uh, paint them on with a little bit of water on one side and then use some color to come in and shadow one part of it. Sometimes what I will do if I have enough color in the uh, evergreen around it, you can take a brush, I probably wouldn't use this brush because that can damage your brush pretty quick take a flat brush and just using a little bit of water you can soften an edge here and there and pull that up into the snow area and it does give it a green look but it snow can have um, some of that color because of the bounce back mm -hmm. reflection yep um, and then I probably wouldn't leave it just at that I probably would put some shadow in there as well uh, because this is wet right here, I can't actually touch this side of that snow, but this edge right here is pretty important to either separate this mm -hmm. bunch of snow from the background snow. Um, so it either has to go darker or it has to stay light. Now, there are times where it's fine if you have an edge that sort of disappears into the area around it. So you don't always have to have every edge stand out. Mm -hmm. But it depends on uh, if it is your center of interest or not, and also if it's an area in the background where you can sort of lose an edge and make it softer. Um, so you also might have shadows that are hard edged. So far, these have mostly been um, soft edged on the tree, and I might, because this is an, on the sunlit side, I might come in with um, some color and just give it a hard edge and that will make it feel like it's really hit by strong sunlight. Um, now sometimes I will put in those hard edges like that and then I'll just come back and soften just a touch here and there and that will sort of make it feel a little less cut out and it'll feel a little more connected to the snow. Um, so if I wanted to um, change down here just a little bit, I might put in, the last thing I think I will show you is, I might just come in with a little bit of some muted color and um, 
put in some maybe some areas down here where under the tree it's a little more in shadow <coughs> and maybe I have um, some footprints in the I'm snow. I was just going to ask you that. That's a footprint. She's coming. Yeah. There we go. We're streaming here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, so footprints, it, can, it really can depend. It depends on if it's an animal, if it's human. Um, you can see them in this one. We were uh, yeah. in the park actually here and there were um, places where you could snowshoe and some people were doing some cross country and stuff. And so it depends on the footprint, but in general, if you just give it a little, um, just kind of a random feel like the snow has got a little depth to it, um, and I'm going to, so I'm not trying to make a specific shape or animal here. So I would look at your image because some images you can definitely tell, oh, that's a, a rabbit or mm -hmm. a fox or something. Um, but just by putting some marks like that in, all of a sudden it gives you the idea that something was moving in there. And um, sometimes it's just the snow that has bunched or fallen off of a tree that can give you that um, mark. So um, shadow wise, definitely look for shadows when you're working with your images. Um, you may have areas that are really, really white. Um, so don't feel like you can't. Uh, this one does, I did put some color in there, but a lot of the time I will leave it just white. And then um, know it's the uh, value changes that are going to make the snow appear white and um, by leaving some areas of white, or you may have a big section that's really white, uh, is going to give you that um, feeling of snow. So it's all those clues together that make it feel like snow. And everybody will have um, possibly a different method of creating their snow. So if you go look up some artists and see what they do in their scenes, they might have a different sort of look to what they do. but. In general, it's going to be purples and blues. Sometimes you may have a little bit of gray, too, or muted purple. Um, any other questions? Some of it is very specific to the certain image you're doing. So as I come around, I'll see if you have questions about your image. But for this one, I did, um, I did the drawing, and then I sent this to you guys if anyone wanted to do this image. Um, and I marked where the blue snow is. I added snow to uh, these areas because I wanted that branch to stand out a little bit more because it was kind of lost in the background. And then I chose a few places down here where I added some snow and then I made the water look like it's flowing down through here and then adjusted that corner. So we talked about that in the last video. So, um, so I have my image and then I went and masked um, the whole tree branch where the snow is, and I also put, which you probably can't see, some little tiny branches in there that I didn't draw, I just decided to add some. Um, I merged my, there's these long branches back here that would be bushes and things during um, the summer, uh, but I decided that I wanted to make them a little smaller and I'm not going to have all these branches poking up through here, it'll be more of a dark shape back there for the evergreens. And then I used uh, masking tape here and here because uh, it's a bigger shape and I just decided I was just going to use the masking tape and do that quickly and then everywhere else the masking fluid. For the water down here, I did not mask the white water so I will have to be careful to paint around that. And I did mask some little white shapes in the water to have some sparkle down there even though it's mostly gray, kind of a pale gray. All right, um, I don't know where I can put this because I'm so zoomed in. Let me zoom out just a little bit. So when I'm looking at this, there's several different places you can start. Because the snow obviously is the lightest area, generally I would think, oh, I'll start with the snow. But then you have to be careful when you're painting around it, so that's where the masking came in. So I then will fall back on the, I generally start in the background and mm -hmm. at the top part of my paintings. In, not for everything, but for a landscape often I do. So for this one, I will be starting with the lighter foliaged bushes in here and putting the evergreen um, feeling colors back through here and ignoring these 
evergreens right here in this corner that are a little closer to the viewer. So I'm going to get, um, I think I'm going to use my Quinn Magenta, which I haven't used in quite a while. You could also use like Quinn Rose, it's just not going to be as deep. Um, if you use Quinn Rose, I would put maybe a little bit of, maybe some cobalt with it to darken it just a little bit, make it a little more magenta-like. Um, so let me grab that. So I have, or will have, the uh, oops, Quinn Magenta. So what I'm looking at for those bushes is they are on the red side during the winter. They have some um, kind of pinky red color to them, so I, that's what I'm looking for. And then I'll use my Burnt Sienna because if I use straight up Quinn Magenta, that's going to be too, for me, and, and this image, too strong. So I will use the Burnt Sienna to tone it just a little bit, and I'm also going to get out a little bit of Cobalt in case I want that as well. Now I will probably put those bushes in and then very quickly go into the background and do some of the background color as well because um, if you can do that at the same time then you get a little more random edge and it will blur those upper edges. Yeah. So before I wet this, because I will be wetting it, I'm going to have my color ready. So I have those three out to do the bushes and then I'm going to get out um, I'm probably going to use my Green Appetite. And Green Appetite Genuine is a Daniel Smith color and it is specifically their color. I don't know that any other, I know some companies are now making certain um, pigments that are the earth of, mm -hmm. created from minerals and, and stones just like the Daniel Smith Primatech series, but um, I don't know that anyone else makes the Green Appetite. So Green Appetite is kind of an olivey green it is very granular, and when it dries, if it is in a wet and wet situation, it can separate and you see brown tones and green. Mm -hmm. Is it close to sap or um, hookers at all? Um, it's definitely not close to hookers. Okay. Hookers is a it's bluer more, green. Yeah. And so. it would be closer to sap, except that it is so granular and it is more neutral. It is okay. on the more neutral. Okay. So if I put it on, let me see. If I put it um, on here, it's very olivey. And this is sap. Sap will be more um, clear and lime green. You can really see the granulation. Yes. Yeah, so as this dries, it will separate and you'll see more of the brown. So this is the green appetite. And what is the other This is sap. Okay. So it is definitely closer, closer to sap. To sap. Okay. Yeah, and sap actually with ultramarine, which is what I'm going to use, oh, okay. is um, very close to um, the green appetite. So I need more ultramarine in my mix. Okay. So I'm going to pull the ultramarine out, and I hardly ever, ever, ever put color away from its well. <laughs> it just makes it easier, but since I've already pulled these out where I've got them, I can have this out and ready. And the reason you want to have your color out and ready is because when you go to do a wet and wet area, it can be drying. Um, you need to like concentrate on what you're doing and not have to think about getting color out. Now I may have to go get more, um, and I may actually use a little bit of the Quinn Magenta back here as well because it's kind of dark and neutral, mm -hmm. so um, I'm not too worried. Uh, I'm not trying to make trees. I'm just trying to make the colors of the area or a dark value. All right, I am going to, I think I'm going to use this, um, my bigger round because that way I can go around some of the shapes. Now I do have, I told you guys last week that I would be painting around the snow back here because there are branches in front of it. So I have to be careful of those um, snow areas. So as I'm coming around in here, I will paint around that and you could like I said you could mask that and then come back later remove the mask and then put in some of those marks for the branches um, but I just felt like I could paint in here and go around those whites 
So it just kind of depends on your comfort level, basically, with doing it like this. And then I'm going to use a little bit in this corner. Um, in this situation, because I'm painting a smaller painting, um, it's more that this is helping me blur my um, foreground, or not foreground, my bushes that are back there and my background color along those edges than it is to help me get the color on there. I can paint this quick enough that I shouldn't need to worry about that. Okay. Well, and even still, I ended up with... You always should kind of lean your head and make sure. <laughs> I always think I've got it covered and then you find something that's not. All right, so for these bushes, um, I'm using the Quinn Magenta and the Burnt Sienna and maybe just a tiny touch of the Cobalt to put these guys in. And I'm going to go and grab a little bit of cobalt because I can push it slightly purpler here and there. And I'm just going back and forth to the burnt sienna and magenta. So it might be a little browner in places. It might go over here to the cobalt. Get some color over there. And there's a bush in here. Now, depending on how wet these guys are, will let me know what I can do. Whoops. Are those branches going across, are they masked? I can't tell. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably a little hard to see on the, it may be okay on the video, but on the TV screen, sometimes it, the screen doesn't quite depict what what is that area on the right that you left white? Over here? Yes. Those are evergreens, oh. and so they are they are uh, more forward. A different color. And yeah, yeah, they're they're a little lighter, and um, so yeah, they're gonna be put in later. Okay, so I have those guys in, and I could have left, um, looking at these bushes right here, I probably could have left a few more openings like I did here with so the snow could peek through. And I just, you know, wasn't thinking about it. So, um, but, you know, no one's going to go and focus right there. So some of those things you just don't worry about. So, all right. So I'm going to get my ultramarine. I'm loading the brush with the ultramarine. And then I'm going to come over and get some of the green appetite. And that's very blue. So I don't want my background to be that blue green. So I can either go get some burnt sienna, which I will do for this in this case because that will neutralize it a little bit, or I could even come over and get some um, Quinn Magenta because the Quinn Magenta is the uh, opposite of the green, and so it will also be a good mix. So I may go back and forth. All right, so I'm starting in that corner, and I'm going to go, um, I went into the Ultramarine and got some Quinn Magenta. I did not go clean my brush though. So, I'm not adding water and I'm, yeah, so I'm just looking for a variety of color. Um, I went straight into the green appetite just then. And as I come down, this is where I have to be careful because I don't want to completely lose my lighter bushes. So it's um, that, is it too wet or is my brush too wet? And I want my edges back there to be a little varied. And if some of this moves in toward where the bushes are, I think that um, will make it interesting because it will just sort of do its own creation of what the shapes are then. Okay. And then I'm going to bring it down into here because there's a shorter bush right in there. I'm going to go back into the green appetite. So these would be evergreens that are sort of layered back in there. Some are in deep shadow, some are just more muted because the light's not on them. Okay. Um, the one thing to be careful of when you're doing this kind of thing is I have a purple area right up there and there's not really any purple around it. 
So you can do that, um, but you might want to come in and put just a touch of purple on some branches on the opposite side of where that color is so that it doesn't feel like it's stained glass. Because the masking fluid can block your colors from moving, and this is drying already. Uh, and Lorraine, is that where you put the extra um, twigs or strings of, of masking? Um, some of it, some of the really small ones I'm yeah. not really seeing. Okay. Yeah, so uh, masking fluid, especially if it's in uh, like a line like that and blocking an area, you really ha kind of have to work your paint across it because it wants to get stuck. Yeah. All right. And then I like right in there where it got blurry. Mm -hmm. So because these areas are drying, I am not going to actually go in there and put any water on it right now. I'm going to let it dry, and then I will come back and soften those edges and make adjustments. Um, one of the things that happens with watercolor is that we try to rush it, and then if it's not working, then we try to go in and fix it, rather than just leaving it be. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yep. And oh, I did, I, and I still do sometimes where you go, oh, I need to fix that now, and it's better just to leave it alone, and then come back and make adjustments. All right. Oh, and actually there is a bush over here as well, and I forgot that guy, so I will leave it. So the bushes just have their first layer of color on them. They will need a little bit more just to give them um, a touch more detail, and then otherwise uh, they're done for now. I will put the water in, and then I'll come around and see what you guys are doing with yours and what, what your images are. So the water... I'm going to put in maybe a couple of passes. So this will just be the first layer and it just gives me the idea of the fact that there's water. And this water is very brown. It's partly because of a lot of rocks underneath. The light is more muted. So you're getting, oh, wow, coloring the table with blue. Um, you're getting more, um, but less of the sky um, reflecting off of it because of how close I am to the water as well. And when I took the picture, all right. So I'm going to pull out Quinn Gold, and I have the burnt sienna out, and I also have the cobalt out still that I could mute it with if I want to. But the Quinn Gold is going to be um, my way of toning the burnt sienna so that it's not just brown. And I may even use a little bit of the Quinn Magenta in it because I see a few places where it feels a little magenta-like. Okay. And then, and for this, you could wet, oh, actually I need to wet it. Sorry, I forgot I have the water down here. I will be using cobalt and burnt sienna for the grays of the waterfall area. And I have, I need more burnt sienna because this is a large area. I need to make sure I have enough of the burnt sienna out. And even if I don't use it all, I can use it with other things. All right. So I have that out. And generally, if I weren't trying to do this fast, I would clean my palette to do this next part. Or I'd move. Sometimes you can, if there's enough color pigment still sitting there, sometimes you can move it off to the side to give yourself enough room to mix. And then I'll pull just a little bit of the Quinn Magenta out. Have that as well. Okay. Before I do that, because I'm, I'm antsy, I want to do this. Okay. This is dry enough now that I can go, and these guys are, are really flat. They're not highlighted at all. I can actually go up in there, just a little bit of water on my brush and I can soften those edges. So um, I don't know if you guys can see it here, but see how this barely has any, it's not as flat as this is, mm -hmm. but um, as long as my brush is, is just barely damp, doesn't have much water in it, I can go in there and play with those edges. And that's one of those, you know, only do it if you think you have um, a handle on what's going on and that you know you can control it but generally it's better to completely let that dry and then come back and soften okay um, so I'm going to take 
water, and I am not worried about the rocks because they are going to be darker. So I'm just going to go all around here, and I'll probably go around these rocks just because it reminds me that I need to paint them in as rocks, and some of them are slightly different colors, so anywhere I can sort of paint around I will. Okay, and then I'm going to go over the area that is water because that will help give me soft edges. And okay, for this now, I am going to start in the back but I have to watch the moisture level up here. I may need to re-wet because it may not um, be real wet when I get down toward there. I'm using just a touch of cobalt at the back with my burnt sienna because I want to have that water area feel a little cooler than, at, than it does as it comes forward. I know it seems weird to be painting the water brown, but it does to me at least. Just a touch of the Quinn Magenta back in here so that there is a sort of a feeling that those bushes might be reflecting. Okay, and then I'm going to start putting in a little bit of the Quinn Gold. And the other thing that I'm going to do is leave little openings where it's lighter because those give it the feeling that there are reflections from the sky happening, or maybe even from the snow around it. It's already drying right there. Mm -hmm. That's pretty. Okay. I'm going to re-wet over in here. Sometimes when I'm wetting my paper to do a big wet and wet area, I will wet it two or three times, and that re-wetting will help it stay moist longer. Right. I don't want brown down in here. I want this to be kind of grays. Oh, my brush still got color on it. Okay. Over there. All right. And then as I'm coming down, um, there is a real kind of more golden color sort of in the middle. I'm going to put just a touch of some my brush. Just a touch of some Quinn Magenta and Cobalt so that it's a little more on the purple side with a touch of the Burnt Sienna on those edges. And if you decide, oh my gosh, if, you, if you're doing this image, if you decide there's too many, it's too big to do all at once, you can um, wet like the back area and wet beyond the back area and then just focus on the back area. Let that dry and then come back and re-wet maybe like an inch past where the new area where you're going to be painting um, is and then you can continue from there. So don't feel like um, you have to try to do this whole thing at once because it can um, feel like it can get away from you pretty quick. All right. I'm coming down, so I'm just kind of varying the color. It's a little warmer here and a little cooler on the edges. And this may end up being too light, but um, it will at least give me a base coat to start with. Okay. Now as I come down in this area, this is where the falls part of it is, and I'm actually going to um, Put a little more color right around there. That's I need that darker value to make this feel lighter. And then as I'm coming into here, I need to, I think it's wet enough. I'm going to switch to my cobalt and burnt sienna so I get a gray. And you could already have the gray mixed. You wouldn't have to do it like that. And then it's um, because this is wet and wet and some of that color is going to blur up into, uh, it's going to move, 
I am leaving some openings, but some of that may disappear as I'm painting. Okay, and I'm looking for kind of the mid value grays, leaving some of the light. And as I'm coming down. Okay, and then this is not on the image, but I'm just going to sort of use that to give me that same feeling. And then there are some places in the upper um, fall where the water is up here that are a little browner. So I'm going back, especially this rock. There's a rock, oops, more brown, less blue. Right here, that, that dark is really important because it is, is what can make this feel lighter makes it feel like there's rocks or something under there. And some of this right in here will go darker, but um, I'll have to wait to do that. Um, okay, so as I'm coming down, it gets browner again. Whoops. So right in here. And I need more brown. So I thought I had enough out, and oftentimes I need to go back. Going around the rocks, and there's some dark in here. And these, again, I could paint over those rocks, but it just kind of helps sometimes just to have them there. And a little bit of some purple in the water right there. And then as I come over here, this is actually drying again, so I will just leave that um, edge and come back to it later. Um, just a little purple right in there. Maybe a little bit of brown on that edge. Okay, so everybody can breathe now. <laughs> um, I'm going to put just a touch right in there between the <coughs> So the, it's already lovely. <laughs> and, and the biggest thing is that's a first layer. So this is where you have to go back and decide how much do I want to push it. But generally with my paintings, I try to get color on sort of everywhere and then decide where I'm going from there. Um, because I have masked where the snow is on this one, I wouldn't remove the mask until I've got more in. So I'd probably put some rocks in. I would maybe go back and add a little bit more to the background up in here. This is kind of cool up in here right now, so I might leave it that way um, because it is in the background. Um, that may be okay, but I do need to put some more up in here and then get more in. So I'll come around and see what you guys are up to and then maybe I'll show you a little bit more on this one later, but I'll come and check and, and we'll go from there. going to do a little more on mine and uh, I did go back and blur the edges of the upper bushes just a little bit and then painted this one in. I have not blurred that edge yet and uh, mm -hmm. right now I'm going to leave the color in the background. I may adjust that later um, and so the next thing I want to do is start getting in some of these rocks because um, that value, that darker value will help give me an idea of if I want to adjust the water. So I've pulled out uh, burnt sienna, I've got some cobalt out, I've got some of my quingold out still, and uh, I think I'm going to get a little bit of, here, dropping my paper towel. I think I'm going to get out a little bit of quin magenta. I don't know if I'll use it, but uh, I could use it in the rocks, possibly, so. The other um, color you could use instead of burnt sienna for the rocks, you could use burnt umber with uh, the, the ultramarine. Um, but these are mostly brown kind of feelings, so there's a little bit of some warmer, almost um, purpley brown, so I might have that apply. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to use the 
burnt sienna, we're laughing because I always say so and all right and everything in my videos, so <laughs> I'm trying to stall, really I am. All right, I did it again. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to cut that one out. <laughs> Editing. Yeah. Exactly. This is the burnt sienna and uh, ultramarine, and I am varying it so it's not all just brown or just gray or blue. So there's a little variety going on in there. And then I am actually going to get just a touch of the um, Queen Magenta to use on that edge with the rock there. And uh, because I have masking fluid on these, I can just go in and paint them right near each other and not worry about uh, them touching. Although, yeah, right here, there is an area over here that would touch, but I'm going to make it look like it's got a snowy edge, so I'll just leave it white. And then I'm going to push into a little bit of the Quinn Gold, this rock, so that there's some variety. Because some of the rocks feel a little warmer, almost orange red, if it was sunny. And by starting to put that dark in, that helps me see whether or not my water is dark enough. And I'm going to do a couple more because that um, will inform me a little better. And these may not get any darker. They may stay this color range. But I'll have to see when they dry. It's pretty dark. Yeah, I'll just see. And this is um, this image is not very sunlit at all, so it's got a little bit of light. It was an overcast time period when I was taking the photo. But putting in the rocks starts to help sort of define where everything is and gives you an idea of um, the water value. Oops. There's actually some grasses sort of along the shoreline right in there, and they're very s kind of small, so I'm just trying to leave some opening so I can paint some kind of gold color in there later. And then I'll do this rock here, and then I think I will... <coughs> I think I will put just a couple more in and then I want to dry it because that way um, I could go and keep doing rocks and get them all in but as long as I know kind of the value that's happening back here that will tell me what I need to do um, kind of toward the front. We'll see. Let's see. Because these guys are darker if I put in um, a lot of dark areas and then I have to paint around them. Sometimes your dark areas can lift and move. So I would prefer to work generally lighter to darker. All right, I'm going to dry that and then um, add some to the water. Now I can tell immediately, and I think you can see it up there, it's a little hard, it's in glare. Um, right in this area of the water, which is right here, I will definitely need to go darker. So I'm, I'll dry this and then I can adjust some in the water. Okay. The uh, method I probably will use back in the back of the water is I'll just do like I do sometimes and just kind of dab some water here and there so it will end up with hard and soft edges and then I will be using those same colors so I'm using the um, actually I need some cobalt out or did I I think I used ultramarine you used ultramarine yeah okay, or okay. Um, so I will use of that purpley color and with just a touch of the burnt sienna in it for these edges because I want to use 
that similar color mix. And by coming back in and adding a layer to your water, you actually create a some of that texture that happens. And uh, with the movement of the water, you get light and darker areas. And so that's what I'm looking for. So I'm leaving some of that lighter area peeking through. And so you did not wet. Uh, that just whole area. No, I just okay. dabbed on. Just yeah, dabbed just on. little places, and it's probably needing another little pass of water. So it, it kind of, I'm still sort of going in a horizontal type of fashion with my brush strokes, though, because I want to make sure that it feels like it's um, flowing. There is a darker space right under this rock. And this is where, um, in the first layer, I was putting color on sort of where I was seeing it, but I wasn't as concerned exactly where things are. And with this layer, I might be a little more concerned, oh, there should be a shadow under that rock um, type of thing. So look for that <coughs> when you're putting the second layer on. And um, let's see, this is a little cooler. So I got a little more blue on my brush, and I'm just darkening under that rock area a touch more. And then as I come down, I would do that same thing down in the middle. So I'm going to go down to this area just so that you can see that. And I will be using water, so I want to make sure my brush is clean. And then I'm going to go and place the water in here. And for this space down here, the reason I put the water up higher is because I may not want this to change value-wise. I don't know that yet. So by putting the water down uh, or up higher than where I will be placing color at this moment, it gives it a place for it to move to without possibly causing a hard edge because I may not want one. Although there is, there are, not there is, there are some hard edges. For now, for me, this is just getting a little more value in this area. And I still want it to feel like the water is moving because this is, um, this was taken in such a way that the water is blurry and it didn't get stop actioned with a faster shutter speed. So I want that feeling of the blurry water. So just darkening right in there, all of a sudden that starts to come out. And then. Um, same thing kind of in here. And we'll go in and this edge uh, is now hard right there, but I can use a little water later if I want to to adjust it. Okay. There is a rock under the water right there. And this is a rock. Actually, it's got just a, it's almost green looking on a couple of the edges. Maybe too much. And then if your rocks are feeling um, kind of cut out, putting some darker values around them can help or softening an edge like I could soften that edge so that it gets a little blurry um, that pushes it and kind of pushes it into the water so they're not all hard edged like right now those are really hard edged so if I wanted these rocks to one because they're in the background not be quite as in focus or um, hard edged I want them to sort of blend into the water a little bit more. I can just come in and just with a brush with a little bit of water on it, I can soften a few edges here and there, and that will help them um, feel like they're a little less um, standing out, a little less hard edged, and they will kind of become part of the water. All right, I'm going to darken over here, and uh, I think I'll just place kind of randomly water and I'm going to use the mostly 
purpley color, but just a touch of the burnt sienna in it, drying my brush since I don't want it too wet. And then come in over here, and I'm going to go into the slightly browner mix. So I was seeing it. Now my walk, my walk, my rock <laughs> is a little <laughs> wet. And so it might blur into that. Let's we'll see. Okay. A little bit of the warm. All right, there, that rock right there, um, right now is basically splitting. I actually added that rock. It's not in the photo. Uh -huh. So um, if you're looking for it, you won't find it. It is on my drawing. It's just not in the photo. Um, and I'm going to darken it. And this is where you have to be careful because I've got so many um, edges that are wet. Um, I would probably be pausing for some of this before I continued. All right, I need to dry that and I've got just a few minutes and I'll show you a couple of the rocks down here. I will skip drying that. I will do a couple of these rocks because um, having those darker rocks on that edge over here it will be good because it'll just give me that much more information about what I want to do in that part of the water. Just kind of varying the color as I go. Um, I cannot paint all the way over there, so um, some of these rocks may need a second coat on parts of them later in order to um, give them the feeling of form. So this I would consider a first coat on some of them because some of them will like these guys are just sort of dark back there but some of these up in here you might go just a touch lighter in places so that you can come back later and add a darker value to give it the shadowed side and there is some water flowing right in there as I come next to the water that's blurry I will need to adjust that edge and I'm going to use some water to do that before it dries. So I want that edge to feel soft and in order to do that, this is a little shiny still, but if I come in with water farther back and then touch next to that paint that's just been put on it's still a little shiny you might pause and not um, do it quite the you know give it a little time or a few seconds for the shine to disperse and then go and wet next to that area and that will give it that softer feeling edge okay and then i'm going to put uh, this rock in and I will stop. So that rock is a little more on the gold side on top of it. And then as it comes down it goes a little browner. So I need more of the burnt sienna and ultramarine. And I'm just doing this wet on wet. You could put the side, or not wet on wet, but wet next to wet. You could put this darker side on after it dries, but this rock has sort of a bumpy, almost mold. Um, it, yeah, it doesn't have hard edges. It's got the softer edges. So. And where that goes. Okay, need that. So same thing for this rock because it connects with the water. Um, I almost think I should. 
was going to say uh, I could do the same thing I did up here where I wet the paper and then use my brush to catch some of those edges and blur them. I wasn't sure how wet it was. All right. And the water that's over here will also get some more texture. So everything sort of right now is in its um, first stages, but uh, I'll keep building it next week.